everyone and welcome to this first ever episode of Wine and Weird Tales where I will be drinking wine and reading weird tales and for this evening's ghoulish delight I will be reading I will be reading Satan's Bondage by Manly Bannister and it's a werewolf western. Please bear with me because I'll be needing to adjust computer screens and get irritated from time to time. Now let's begin. The desert seemed molten when seen through the windshield of the green coupe. That was because of the angle the rays of the afternoon sun made with the glass. And Kenneth Mulvaney was driving directly into the glare. The car laboured up an incline, pacing, whirling dust devil. Pacing a whirling dust devil on the climb, incandescent boulders shimmered along the rough, rutted way. Desiccated cacti showed dusty green against the ochre and yellow of desert background. On the horizon, blue hills wavered in Mulvaney's vision, dim and incandescent. He mopped the sweat from his forehead for the dozenth time, clinging with one hand to the wretchedly twisting wheel. God, what a road! The engine punctuated his exclamation with a sharp cough, gave a straining wheeze, and died. A glance at the instrument panel discovered the red of the thermometer had squeezed as far to the right as it could possibly go. Boiling water plumped tunefully in the radiator. He switched off the ignition with a motion of abrupt disgust. Nothing for it now but to sit out here on this damned desert until the engine... <coughs> cooled. If it ever would under this blazing sun. Now that the machine was no longer moving, the heat clamped in upon him with reeking fingers. The sun was a burning lance that thrust through the top of the car and into his skull. Enough of that was enough, he decided. He crawled from behind the wheel into the dust and pulverised grit of the road. A hell of a road, he remarked. Remar a hell of a road, he remarked, and eyed the twisting length of it along the way he had come. Dust devils galloped playfully, writhing brown towers with roots in the baking earth and crests, smudging the blue-tinted brass of the sky. There was water in the luggage compartment. A good drink would lower Lizzie's fever. Dust spurted from under his shoe soles as he trudged forward with the five-gallon gasoline tin in his grip. He lifted the hood, took cap off water can and radiator, and stood back as a cloud of steam first spurted then drifted into the astringent heat of the air. When the cloud had thinned somewhat, he tilted the can and permitted the precious water to gurgle throbbingly into the overheated intestines of the radiator. Need help, mister? Mulvaney hadn't heard the girl appear. Mulvaney hadn't heard the girl approach. He nearly dropped the water tin from surprise. You gave me a start, he said, controlling himself. He focused his glance. He focused the glance of his grey eyes upon her face. She wasn't smiling, but it seemed that she was. The set of her face was made for laughter. Her eyes were blue. Her hair was golden blonde, her complexion well tanned. She was dressed in some sort of boots and breeches arrangement designed for hiking. Dust covered her slim figure from the toes of her awkward boots to the grayed bandana that held her vagrant curls in place. I wear it to keep the sun from doing unmentionable things to my hair, she explained. The corners of her full mouth twitched. Not to speak of boiling my brain in its own water. He set the watering tin carefully at his feet. Where do you come from? I'd no idea there was a soul within miles. A shadow crossed her face. So there isn't, she said strangely. Then I was hiking along just over that rise, she gestured. 
I heard your car thumping up the hill. I was all set to thumb a ride when it stopped, so I came back to see what's up. The motor overheated and uh, conked on me, he explained. He eyed her speculatively, almost prompted to ask what business brought her on foot into this god-forsaking wilderness. He wondered if it was possible she were bound for the same place he was. He forced an end to his speculation. She'll be cool enough to start off again pretty soon, he said. You're welcome to ride along as far as I go. There was a certain blankness in her gaze that troubled him. Her blue eyes clouded briefly. How far are you going? More than ordinarily curious, the tone was. Whereville? He wondered if it were only imagination that made him believe she gasped as he pronounced the name. It was devilishly hot. Enough to fry your brains and make you imagine almost anything. She didn't ask why he was going to Whereville. He took advantage of their momentary silence to replace the water in the luggage compartment. She said, stood <laughs> She stood silently in the blazing sun, shoe soles sunk into the powdery loess. I don't is that a word? Loess Loess L O E double S her look as she regarded the dead motor was as if she hoped by some alchemy of glance to bring it to life again. I think it ought to run now, she said. He tramped forward through the dust and peered at the, the thermometer. The crimson line had shrunk somewhat, although it still hovered near the danger line. A few more minutes anyway, he told her. Dust churned from under the wheels of the green coupe. Its engine was functioning wonderfully again. Mulvaney had never seen ten such miles. That's what a native of Last Water had said it was. Last Water was on the highway. Where, 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 where? Whereville was in the foothills of the mountains, looming bluely ahead. In between were ten scorching miles. The road they were on, if it could be called a road, led to Whereville and a few isolated ranches in the mountain valleys. They passed a cowboy canteen. No, oh, no, they didn't. They passed a cowboy cantering along on the paint. They passed a cowboy cantering along on a paint pony, a thin, grey-faced man with a clean look of open about him. They passed a cowboy cantering along on a paint pony, a thin, grey-faced man with the clean look of the open about him. A ten-gallon hat shaded his face. He reined to one side, waved as they passed. Then he inclined forward in his saddle, cut short the salute, cut short the salutation, and sat rigidly, staring. Mulvaney observed the dancing image in his rear vision mirror and clucked. Almost friendly for a minute, wasn't he? Already the cowboy was hidden in the dust that swirled about him, them. The girl did not turn to look. She shrugged only slightly, and the expression of her eyes was singularly blank. You live on a ranch out this way? Question mark. She shook her head. If she didn't live on a ranch, she must... He put the thought into words. Then you must live in Weville. She turned her head quickly and stared full in his face. A faint expression of scorn curled her red lips and her eyes were flashingly cold. Suppose I do. So what? The tone of her voice was sharp, combative. He recoiled from the fierce glow of her expression. A sterner man would have been tongue-tied. Mulvaney was completely stopped. In spite of her sudden, wolfish ferocity, he felt that her attitude was not meant for him. Somehow he realised vaguely that she directed it at the cowboy they had left sitting his paint pony. 
by the roadside. The question Mulvaney had been about to ask was stilled on his tongue. Chance was, she couldn't help anyway. Better to wait until he got to Wareville and make his inquiries there. Then he thought of the grim figure the cowboy had made after his initial gesture of friendliness. Something very likely a chill. Something very like a chill prickled along his spine. It was an eerie feeling he had that all was not well with the town of Wareville. He recalled vaguely things he had read about range wars. Could he be getting into something like that here? If so, the girl and the cowboy evidently belonged to opposing factions. That would explain this slight incident. Or would it? He shrugged dismally and scanned the road ahead. They were skirting the shoulder of a foliage. No, they weren't. They were skirting the shoulder of a tan hill. In front of them, the dusty green foliage of a clump of cottonwood glimmered in the sun. A small herd of cattle browsed on the grass that grew sparsely. A creek tumbled out of a ravine here, spanned by a wooden bridge. The girl laid her hand on his arm. The touch electrified him. Stop here, she commanded. He eased in the clutch and let the green coupe roll to a halt at the approach of the who the fuck was Lizzie? Is she in the back seat? Stop here, she commanded. He eased in the clutch and let the green coupe roll to a halt at the approach of the bridge. The road continued straight ahead, angling across the desert. Wareville is that way, the girl said, pointing across the bridge, toward the ravine. I'll walk in from here. You better go back to Last Water or stop at one of the ranches hereabouts and go back in the morning. She started to get out. Forgive me for not telling you sooner. She smiled slightly. It was awfully hot and I was tired of walking. He looked at her with blank amazement. But you don't understand. I'm going to Wareville too. But you don't understand. I'm going to Wareville too. She shook her head. You thought you were. You were going back to Last Water, really. She slid towards the door. Here, Mulvaney said. You can't do that. I'm taking you to Wareville. Her eyes grew stormy. Don't be a fool, mister. Whatever your name is. They don't want to let you in. Don't be a fool, mister. Whatever your name is, they won't let you in. Go back now and save yourself the trouble. I'm not in the habit of saving myself trouble, he said grimly, and let out the clock. Ah, oh, Lizzie must be the car. Okay. Yeah. Duh. The green coupe nosed into the bridge approach and roared into the cottonwood grove. Just in time, Mulvaney plunged his foot upon the brake. The cough halted with not six inches separating its front bumper and the massive palings of a wooden gate. A leaden stranger in dusty overalls sat hunched on the top rail, meditatively chewing a blade of grass. Ain't no passage beyond this gate, mister, he called out. Mulvaney's glance swiveled to a weather-beaten sign. Wareville, five miles, it said, and had an arrow pointing off up the ravine. You had to be smart, the girl said. I told you so, but thanks for the lift. Am I missing something? No. She got out and waved to the man perched above them. Hi, Jim. Hi, Joan. Your poor and more is waiting for you. Ah, uh, Pa and Ma is waiting for you. Better get along. You can't block a public thoroughfare like... Blah. You can't block a public thoroughfare like this, Mulvaney cried out hotly. The man Jim pointed silently to a cloth sign tacked upon the gate. 
it bore a signature of the sheriff, the signature of the sheriff, proclaimed that intruders were trespassers and such would be prosecuted. I don't care what that says, Mulvaney thrust at him. I've got business in Wareville and I'm going in there. What business you got in Wareville, said Jim, Jim said, and whistled softly. Three men armed with shotguns stepped out of a leafy concealment. The eldest of the trio had a white beard. They stared levelly at Mulvaney. No strangers, it's for your own good, the beard said flatly. The girl watched Mulvaney with something like grim amusement in her glance. Maybe you'll give up now, she suggested. He surveyed the armed group doubtfully. They appeared menacing enough, but not overly dangerous. Damn it, no, he explained. I'm not a stranger. The bearded man stepped closer and peered at him through the bars of the gate. I'm not a stranger, Mulvaney repeated. I, I, well, I belong here. Who are you? Kenneth Mulvaney. I was born in Wareville. I left with my parents while I was still a baby. Todd and Mary Mulvaney questioned the eldest, oldest, oldest. The man Jim had clambered down off the gate and joined the armed group. Mulvaney remained angrily at the wheel of the green coupe. The girl Joan, he wondered vaguely, what the uh, what? Mulvaney remained angrily at the wheel of the green coupe. The girl Joan, he wondered vaguely what the other name she had, uh, regarded him with startled wonder. The. Greybeard harangued the group in low tones, then turned back to Mulvaney. Mulvaney stuck his head from behind the windshield. Well? I'm Hank Simpson. Where's your folks, boy? Mulvaney hesitated. Dead, sir, he said reluctantly. When I was still a boy, I was raised in an orphanage. You remember your people coming from Wareville? Mulvaney crushed back a desire to read... Mm. Do you know, it's like one thirty-seven in the morning, and I don't think I continue right now. So, maybe we'll leave off till, um, you know, I shouldn't still be drinking. This is ridiculous. Fuck, I got work tomorrow. <sighs> Mulvaney hesitated. Dead, sir, he said reluctantly. When I was still a boy, I was raised in an orphanage. You remember your people coming from Wareville? Mulvaney crushed back a desire to resent Simpson's question. No, sir, he said truthfully. I read about it in my mother's diary. I thought maybe, maybe I might find some relatives here. Simpson shook his beard... <laughs> Simpson shook his bearded head, pale, bright eyes. No, Todd and Mary had no kin. No. Todd and Mary had no kin. But if you're who you say you are, you've got friends. If you're not, may God help you. He's the only one who can. Hank Simpson stepped aside and jerked his head to the others. Watching Mulvaney curiously, they came forward and swung the gate wide. And that's where we'll leave off. Uh, I guess we'll call this part one. I don't know how many parts there'll be. Um, time will tell. One more zip. Uh, I apologize, but it's late. I probably left it too late. Um, <sighs> Thanks for joining me.